So to continue from the last video, I should also mention that the criteria that we use to diagnose things like LVH and RVH are less helpful when you have a bundle branch block, that is when you have a QRS complex that's wide. This is because when you have a left bundle branch block, the forces of depolarization become more exaggerated on the left side, and so your R waves will already look taller there. Thus, when you have a left bundle branch block, you can't call something LVH simply because the voltage in V1 and V5 add up to more than 35 millimeters. Similarly, with a right bundle branch block, the forces become more exaggerated anteriorly in the area of the right ventricle, and so your QRS will already look positive and lead V1. Thus, when you have a right bundle branch block, you can't call something RVH simply because the R is greater than the S and lead V1 with right axis deviation. Okay, now let's talk about low voltage. In some patients, you'll notice that the QRS complexes are very small in amplitude. We call this low voltage. Now, can you think of some disease processes that can produce an EKG with low voltage? So you can see low voltage in patients who are obese because there is increased tissue between the heart and the chest wall. Similarly, patients with emphysema can have low voltage due to increased inflation of the lungs within the chest cavity. Volume overload states such as anisarca or pleural effusions are also associated with low voltage. Other causes include pericardial effusion, cardiomyopathies of any number of etiologies, critical illness, ischemic heart disease, infiltrative disease such as amyloidosis, and severe hypothyroidism, which is also associated with sinus bradycardia. Now there are a number of other things that can produce low voltage on an EKG, but these are some of the more important ones. Now for this step, when you're reading an EKG, after you scan for each different kind of chamber enlargement, I think it's fine to just eyeball the tracing as a whole and make sure the QRS complexes don't look overly small. Formal criteria for diagnosing low voltage include, in the limb leads, all of the QRS complexes are smaller than five millimeters in total amplitude, measured from the top of the positive deflection to the bottom of the negative deflection. We call this low voltage by limb lead criteria. Alternately, if you notice that the QRS complexes are all smaller than 10 millimeters from top to bottom in the precordial leads, you can call it low voltage by precordial lead criteria. Okay, enough talk about diagnostic criteria. Now let's fast forward and pretend that I've given you enough time to memorize these criteria. Let's try walking through a couple of 12 lead EKGs and see how we do at spotting chamber abnormalities. So let's start with this one. So as we're walking through the chambers, step one is to look for signs of left ventricular hypertrophy. So for LVH, we look to see if the depth of the S wave in lead V1 plus the height of the R wave in lead V5 exceeds 35 millimeters. In other words, we're looking to see if the negative deflection in V1 plus the positive deflection in V5 exceeds 35 millimeters. And so for this step, I might have to dust off Windows calculator, but let's see. So we're gonna look in lead V1 we can see that the negative deflection is about zero millimeters. Now let's move on to lead V5. Looking in V5, we can see that the positive deflection is about two millimeters. And so zero plus two equals two millimeters, which is much less than 35 millimeters, and so we don't have LVH. Next, let's look for signs of RVH. So for right ventricular hypertrophy, we look in lead V1 to see if the R is taller than the S. In other words, we're looking to see if the QRS complex is generally positive. Additionally, in the frontal plane, our QRS axis should be vertical or rightward. And so looking here in lead V1, we can see that the R wave is taller than the non-existent S wave, and the QRS complex is positive. And so now we'll just look to see if our axis points vertically or rightward. So at this point, I know what you're thinking to yourself. I can't believe he's going to walk us through axis again. I mean, this is child's play. We got this. And so because it's child's play, I'll go ahead and do this one quickly. So step one for the axis is we find the isoelectric lead. And so looking at these six frontal plane leads, which one looks most isoelectric to you? So looking here, we can see that lead two definitely looks closest to a neutral deflection. And so let's go with that one. So now let's look at our hexaxial diagram that we've memorized. Here's our isoelectric lead. And so for step two, we have to choose the correct perpendicular. And so we know our axis points either 90 degrees in this direction towards lead AVL or 90 degrees in this direction towards lead 3. And so now we just have to look at one other lead to break the tie. And so let's look in lead AVL and we're going to look to see is the QRS complex positive, which would mean that the axis would point towards lead AVL. 
or is it negative, which would mean that the axis would point away from lead AVL. And so looking here in lead AVL, you can see that the QRS complex is negative, and so that means our axis points away from lead AVL. And so we can draw our axis like this in the vicinity of lead 3. For step 3, to fine-tune the axis, we look back at our isoelectric lead, and we ask ourselves, is it slightly positive or slightly negative? And so let's look at lead 2. So looking at lead 2, we can see that the QRS complex is slightly positive. That means that our axis is moving slightly towards lead 2. In other words, the axis is a little bit less than 90 degrees away from lead 2. So to fine-tune our axis, we can draw it like this, a little bit closer to lead 2. So how would you interpret this axis? Is this a normal axis? No, it's right axis deviation. And so because we have r greater than s in lead v1 and right axis deviation, we can say that we have signs of right ventricular hypertrophy. Now even more suggestive of a diagnosis of RVH are these small T-wave inversions in the right precordial leads, so leads V1, V2, and V3. And even more suggestive is this tiny little septal Q-wave preceding the R-wave in lead V1. Now I should say that a number of things can produce RVH, however patients who have predominant pulmonary disease tend to have QRS complexes that are smaller, particularly in the precordial leads. This is in contrast to, let's say, someone who has RVH due to primary pulmonary hypertension or mitral valve disease. And so you can see here in leads V1 through V6, this patient has QRS complexes that are pretty small and generally poor r wave progression, which is consistent with severe pulmonary disease. Now let's look for signs of left atrial abnormality. So for left atrial abnormality, we look in lead V1 for a P wave that's negative or biphasic. And so looking here in V1, we can see that this P wave is generally pretty positive. And if there's really any negative deflection at the end, it's pretty small. And it's definitely not more than one small box in area under the curve. We can also eyeball lead 2, and we can see that these P waves are not broad. And so we don't have any signs of left atrial abnormality here. For right atrial abnormality, we look in lead 2 for a P wave that's tall, taller than 2.5 millimeters. So looking here in lead 2, we can see that this P wave is quite tall. In fact, it looks like it's taller than the R-wave. And so I'm going to say this is right atrial abnormality. Also, if we look in lead V1, we can see that the P wave is taller than 1.5 millimeters, which was that optional criteria that you didn't have to memorize. And so that's also consistent with right atrial abnormality. And so, so far we've got RVH and right atrial abnormality. So now let's look for signs of low voltage. And so eyeballing these QRS complexes, we can see that they generally look pretty small. For low voltage, we look to see are the QRS complexes less than 5 millimeters from top to bottom in the limb leads, or are they less than 10 millimeters from top to bottom in the precordial leads? And so looking in the limb leads, we have some QRS complexes that are smaller than 5 millimeters, and other ones that are greater than 5 millimeters in total amplitude. And so we don't meet limb lead criteria for low voltage. Now let's look at the precordial leads. And so looking at these precordial leads, we can see that all of the QRS complexes are smaller than 10 millimeters from top to bottom. And so we do meet low voltage by precordial lead criteria. And so on this EKG, we've identified right ventricular hypertrophy, right atrial enlargement, low voltage, and right axis deviation. And so this constellation of findings is consistent with severe pulmonary disease, such as emphysema. In this case, this patient had severe interstitial lung disease. Now let's go ahead and take a look at one more EKG. So you'll notice here that I've listed all of my handy diagnostic criteria off to the side. I decided that this time around I'd rather not mark up all over my EKG. And so on this EKG, let's go ahead and start with step one, which is looking for signs of left ventricular hypertrophy. So for LVH, we look to see is the S in V1 plus the R in V5 or V6 greater than 35 millimeters. So looking in lead V1, we can see that our S wave is about 5, 10, 15, 20, 23 millimeters. So now we just have to add this up to the height of the R wave in lead V5 or V6. Now it's a little bit challenging to make out the height of the R wave here, but it looks to be about 5, 10, 11, 12, 13 millimeters. And so now all we have to do is add up 23 plus 13, which adds up to 36 millimeters which is just over 35 and is consistent with LVH. Now you might have noticed that the R waves in lead V6 are significantly taller than the R waves in lead V5, 
And so alternately, we could have used lead B6 instead of lead B5 to determine if the patient meets Sokolow line criteria for LVH. And so let's go ahead and look in B6. And so looking here in B6, you can see that the R wave is quite tall. And so let's go ahead and count this. Now I'll tell you that in real life, for the purpose of speed, I usually just count off in multiples of five, and I don't really get into the nitty gritty of number of millimeters unless the voltage is close to LVH. And so here we'll just go ahead and count off in gross multiples of five. And so you can see we've got five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, I'd say about 35 millimeters just in V6. And so 35 plus 13 is definitely more than 35 millimeters. And so this is also consistent with LVH. Now one more criteria for LVH is to look to see if the R wave in lead AVL is taller than 11 millimeters in amplitude. And so let's go ahead and check out AVL. Now looking in lead AVL, you can see that this R wave is also very tall. It's about five, 10, 15, 20, 20 millimeters in height. And so this is also consistent with LVH. Now you'll also notice that you have these septal Q waves here. Septal Q waves are often seen in patients with long-standing hypertrophy. They are typically seen best in leads that have the tallest R waves. And so for example, in patients with LVH, you'll be more likely to see septal Q waves in leads V5, V6, and AVL. And in patients with RVH, you'll be more likely to see septal Q waves in lead V1 and lead 3. You'll also notice on this EKG that we have these T wave inversions and subtle ST depression, which likely represent a secondary repolarization abnormality due to the patient's long-standing left ventricular hypertrophy. Now I should point out again that the first thing that your mind should jump to when you see ST depressions and T wave inversions is cardiac ischemia, something like a secondary repolarization abnormality, which is sometimes seen in long-standing hypertrophy should be more of a diagnosis of exclusion. Okay, now let's look for RVH. So for right ventricular hypertrophy, we look in lead V1 for an R deflection that's greater than the S deflection. Now the axis should also be vertical or rightward. And so let's go ahead and look in lead V1. Now looking in lead V1, we can see that our QRS complex is almost totally negative and we have basically no R deflection. So no, R is not greater than S and we don't have signs of RVH. Now let's look for signs of left atrial enlargement. So for left atrial enlargement, we look in lead V1 for a P wave that's negative or biphasic, and the negative deflection should be greater than one small box in its area under the curve. Alternately, we can look in lead 2 for a P wave that's broader than three small boxes in width. So let's go ahead and look at lead V1. And so looking in lead V1, you can see that we have a P wave that's very negative and slurred. And so this is textbook for left atrial abnormality. Now, alternately, we could have looked in lead two to see if the P wave is broad, broader than three small boxes in width. And so let's go ahead and take a look at lead two. Now, looking in lead two, you'll notice that the P wave is fairly broad. I'd say it's about three small boxes in width. And so this is also consistent with the diagnosis of left atrial abnormality. So for left atrial abnormality, I'm gonna go ahead and put down a darn tootin Okay, now let's go ahead and look at right atrial abnormality. So for right atrial abnormality, we look in lead two for a P wave that's taller than 2.5 millimeters in height. So let's go ahead and look in lead two. So looking here in lead two, you can see that this P wave is not taller than 2.5 millimeters in height. And so we don't have right atrial abnormality. Okay, now finally, let's go ahead and scan for signs of low voltage. And so for low voltage, we scan the limb leads to see if all of the QRS complexes are smaller than five millimeters from top to bottom. Then we can scan the precordial leads to see if all of the QRS complexes are smaller than 10 millimeters from top to bottom. And so let's go ahead and zoom out here and look at our EKG. And so looking at both the limb leads and the precordial leads, you can see that we have a ton of voltage here due to the patient's LVH. And so no, we don't meet criteria for low voltage. So putting it all together, the key findings on the CKG are left ventricular hypertrophy and left atrial abnormality, likely stemming from long-standing hypertension. Okay, that's all I've got for chamber abnormalities. Be sure to tune in next time when we talk about the all-important ischemia and infarction.